All right, hello everyone. I'm going to tell a few stories today. Before I do, I want to establish some credibility so you believe the stories. So just a few words about uh, what I did and what I do. Let's go to the next slide. Just a quick intro. So I've spent 20 years of my life in Silicon Valley starting and building companies, all in the consumer internet space. Couple failed. The first company was a complete, miserable, embarrassing failure. Some others did okay and some did very well. Um, so I'm going to tell you stories from my experience building this company. So specifically, I want to talk about two companies I'm most proud of. One of them is called Epic. It's a educational technology company, EdTech. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so it's the largest uh, kids digital reading platform in the world. 75 million kids use it on a monthly basis. Lots of teachers, over a million teachers use it to teach kids in schools that were used in over 90% of all the elementary and middle schools in the US. One billion books were read just last year on Epic. So the numbers are enormous. Even I cannot comprehend them. Uh, just to give you a perspective for a book, a traditional book to become a, a New York Times bestselling book, you need to sell 5,000 copies of that book. Then you get on the list. Uh, at Epic, when we release a new book, it's read 1 million times within a week. So it's way, way beyond even the traditional understanding of what books and reading is. Um, so it's a company that's truly transformational for many children. It's been called a generational company. It's a mission impact company. It isn't even a company I've never intended to make money. It was really a company where I wanted to solve a big problem that I saw in the world, which is access to education, access to books for children. And the next company that I did before that was a gaming company. It was just your typical um, traditional mobile uh, meat core to casual gaming company. It did very well. We had 200 million poor souls play games. We've made a lot of these games with a lot of mistakes. It was a roller coaster ride with a lot of lessons learned. One thing I realized that games are a complete waste of time for people who play them, but they're actually a lot of fun to create. So don't play games. If you want to do something with games, create them because it's a very fun process. And that company, again, was um, sold for a lot of money. Now these games are in the portfolio of EA, Electronic Arts. They're in the App Store, and they're making about $300 million a year. So um, this was fun. Lots of great lessons learned. So let's go to the next slide. So why did I put creativity in the title of this presentation? Because for many entrepreneurs, and let's go to the next slide, you are the first solving a problem. There is no data. You cannot even make a single decision based on data because you don't have data. The data-driven decision-making comes much later if you're successful. But when you're just starting out, you just have an idea and you probably don't even know what you're doing with that idea. That idea will probably transform and pivot into something else. So you have nothing. All you have is your creativity to solve the problem. That's really all you have. And there's another ingredient, which is hard work. And I also put it in the slide. Be because hard work, because it's a key ingredient. It's, it's basically a thing that you cannot avoid. And let's go to the next slide. It's, it's a very simple formula and it's very obvious. The input is your work, you amplify the output is hopefully much greater results. And it's just the, the fundamental concept of building something from scratch. And surprisingly, it works for evil, bad people. If somebody wants to take over the world, if somebody wants to destroy the planet, they just have to work very hard and they will succeed. And it also works for nice people. If you're a really nice person and you want to do something nice for this world, you work hard, you'll succeed. So ironically, if a nice person doesn't work hard and an evil person works hard, the evil person will be more successful. So 
a lot of people are afraid to work hard. It's definitely um, very, very time consuming, very stressful. So, but it's really a wrong question to ask. I, what I found is that, yes, you have to work hard, but it doesn't have to be hard. Let's go to the next slide. So what I think is one of the most important things is creativity, but another one is you have to have fun when you are building a company. Um, different people have different ideas of what fun is. For me, fun is pranking people. It's like literally you work with people, you prank them. But if you do that, it also has to have a meaning. You don't do it just randomly. You do, you do it to maybe learn a lesson and maybe teach them a lesson. So hard work without fun is slavery. But hard work with passion and purpose and fun is actually, you don't even notice it. You actually do something great, you achieve something great with that. So I'm going to tell a few stories from my experience building some companies and some lessons learned from that. So cookies, uh, that happened all the time, it happens all the time. And it really bothers me when people walk away from their desks and don't lock their computers, they leave them open. And I always thought anybody can walk in from the street, especially in uh, open uh, offices where they have an open space and can mess with a computer and it has confidential information on it. And so what I started doing when I saw people that walk away from the desk, it's really hard to break that habit. You tell them they don't really change. I would go to their computer and I would send an email on their behalf from them to the whole company saying, hey everyone, I'm going to bring cookies tomorrow. So this person would come back to their uh, computer, see some responses from others saying, hey, thank you, this is awesome. Um, and they had to bring cookies. And then when I feel like having donuts, I would say, hey, I'm going to bring donuts tomorrow. And so this person had to bring donuts. And then it was uh, also um, bagels because everybody loves bagels. And so over time, it was a win-win situation. We all had cookies and bagels and donuts and people stopped leaving their computers unlocked. Uh, the clown. So this was a failed experiment. So what's very uh, typical when you run a company is you do this, um, what we call all hands company meetings. When um, you share updates, multiple people present what they've been working on. So I used to do it weekly at CrowdStar and I do it uh, monthly at Epic. So specifically at CrowdStar, I always try to make these meetings weird and awkward and funny and creative and different. And so one day I thought about bringing a clown, like literally inviting a clown to the meeting. And um, people expect the clown to be funny, to do the clowny things. And I thought, I'll do the opposite. I'll have the clown just stand there next to me, looking confused, and the clown would do nothing. And I thought it would be funny. Um, so I did that, but it turns out, and I didn't know that, there is a thing in the US, it's called the fear of clowns. I don't know if it's a thing here or anywhere else, but I was presenting in front of a terrified audience who didn't know why there is a clown standing next to me. And I was pretending that I didn't even have a clown next to me. The clown was also very confused standing there. Everybody was terrified. One of our uh, game artists, and we had a lot of artists who would draw art for the games, she actually sketched a um, picture of a little girl running away from a clown who was chasing her. It's a beautiful drawn picture. And so the lesson I learned from this is that if you're building a company, stay away from clowns. No clowns. So Alfred, that was at Epic when we were just starting uh, our journey at Epic. We were very disorganized. It was absolutely okay to be late to meetings. Nobody cared. Five minutes late, 10 minutes late. No respect for others, no respect for people's times. We were very, very disorganized, including myself. I'm not very good at being organized. And um, things like shipping on time wasn't a thing, you know, um, like nothing was working properly. 
And I wasn't the person who could get everybody organized. I knew that. I'm not the right guy for that. But I knew who would be the right guy. And that would be Alfred. So I made up Alfred. It was a completely virtual, fake person that completely made up. I created this character. We found, including uh, I asked uh, for help from our artists, we found a stock photo online of a person who I think should be that Alfred guy. Uh, so we made a cardboard cutout. That's approximately that side of a human. And this is the actual picture of the cardboard heart, the cutout. And I created these principles of what Alfred would do and would say. And in my mind, Alfred was a retired company executive who took up gardening as a hobby. And so he would say, Alfred would say things like that, you know, it, there is no such thing as can be done. It has to be done. You cannot even question that it can be or cannot be done. Or um, hard, nobody says hard to do. You either do it or you don't. If you don't, somebody else will do it. Pretty obvious things, but I couldn't say them myself. So I had to put it on Alfred. The other thing he said is that great job is for the week. Why would you tell someone a great job if they're already expected to do a great job? They shouldn't be here if they were not doing a great job. If they want to hear a great job, that means they are insecure. So that it's, it's not my idea, it's Alfred's idea. It's all, always blaming that on Alfred. Um, this is an obvious one, excuses. Like Alfred doesn't want to hear any excuses. It, if you're an ex even the single excuse, you're a loser. You should not be here. That one also, I don't necessarily agree with this, but that's what Alfred said. The best place to find a helping hand is at the end of your own arm. So no one's going to help you. It's you got to solve your own problem yourself. And so I would take this cutout figure. I, I, was, I was presenting. I presented this at the company all hands meeting. I explained people that this is Alfred. He's our mentor. He's standing next to me. He's going to be involved in company now. And so I would take them, take Alfred, this cutout figure, to all the company meetings. Yes, in fact, the Alfred would be in the room already before the meeting starts. And so people would walk in, Alfred would stand there, and if somebody's late, Alfred is not happy. And so what started happening is suddenly, within weeks, our culture started changing. People suddenly started coming to meetings on time, started shipping features on time. Suddenly, we were operating much better. There is this thing called operational excellence, which is like this ultimate goal of achieving operational excellence where everybody works like a robot. Um, and so we, we were getting there. Suddenly, everything has been really working well. Within literally a month or two, we were improving. And I wasn't the bad guy. Alfred was a bad guy. I was still the nice guy. It was ongoing. Everything was going very well until someone actually cut off Alfred's head. And so in that case, what do you do with a human head in the office? You put it in the fridge. And so Alfred's head ended up in our office refrigerator and it was scaring all the visitors who would open the fridge door to get a drink. And so that head remained in the fridge for many, many weeks. And then a couple of volunteers then took Alfred's headless body and took it outside and dumped it in a dumpster. So that was the end of Alfred. But then at some point, very soon after he died, we realized we don't need him anymore. We actually, he served, served his purpose. We actually are gotten so much better at running and executing on, on the company's daily tasks. And so, at some point also later, we hired a COO, a person out of military, a former Air Force officer who took Alfred's ideas even further and the company just operates like a dream now. This story about Italy is from Crowdstar, my gaming company. So what happened there is that when we were just getting started, maybe one year in, we were about 40 people and we were celebrating something, I don't remember what. We were on a boat in San Francisco Bay and we had an open bar, unlimited alcohol. And so alcohol and startups, they go really well together. It's a, they mix well. Uh, and um, 
at some point, people had enough drinks. Somebody approached me and said, you know, we just thought about this idea. Maybe our next company event should be in Italy. Maybe we should all go to Italy. It was like, interesting idea. I don't know about that. And then my co-founder was standing next to me. He heard it and he had many more drinks than me. He said, it's a great idea. I'm going to announce it right now. So he stands up on a table and says, listen up, everyone. We are going to Italy. And everyone goes like, yay, awesome. And somebody says, wait, but what about our families? And he goes, they can come too. And so the next morning, we realized what we have done, but it was too late. And so we actually had to pull it off. We um, rented a villa for six weeks in Tuscany. We chartered two planes and we flew 80 people to Italy. It was an incredible logistical operation. I wasn't involved. It was my team who did it. Um, it, it went all well. It resulted in one marriage proposal in Italy and a beautiful family now. Uh, lots of friendships formed. People came back um, with very high morale. For a lot of them, this was their first trip outside of the US. They didn't even know that there is a world outside of, you know, beyond New York. So what did it do to the company? Suddenly, everybody wanted to work at Crowdstar. We started getting lots of resumes. The word spread that this, this is an amazing company, sends people to Italy. Um, and we started growing like crazy. We, we, we were able to hire really, really great employees. Even to these days, this been this been 10 years now, people still remember. Everybody who has been uh, in Italy at that time, when they get together, everybody remembers how great this was. With minimal injuries, people went there with, again, lots of alcohol involved, but very minimal injuries. Nobody died. So I was a king of France for a very short period of time. I was invited to speak at a conference. And what conference organizers usually do is they ask you to send them a bio, like a short bio of um, who you are, what you do. And so I thought about, I'm going to just add something unusual to this bio. I'm just going to see if they even notice it. And uh, maybe they take it out or maybe they don't. And so they asked me for the bio, about, about a 500 person conference uh, where I was a speaker. Um, the bio was supposed to be printed on brochures to be distributed to all the conference attendees on, and on the um, website. So I sent them my bio, but I've added, let's go to the next slide to highlight it. So I was a king of France from 1734 to 1738 And also I am an expert in monarchy. This is actual brochure from the conference. They just took it and copy pasted it and gave it to 500 people. And the sad thing about this is that nobody noticed. Nobody, like literally nobody at the conference out of these 500 people noticed this. I had to point it out to people. And so what I've learned from this is that nobody reads anything. And so whenever in a product somebody tells me, well, the users are confused here, let's add some text explaining how to use this feature. It's not going to work. Nobody reads. Let's go to the next slide. This is the story of um, our first game that we made at Crowdstar, my gaming company, which was our biggest hit. For some reason, again, no data, nothing, absolutely nothing, my intuition, told me that we need to create a fish game. I don't know why. Uh, there was no even a precedent. Nobody was even playing fish games or Korean games. Um, so we had some really good artists. One of them came with an idea that if there is a fish swimming in an aquarium, the fish should smile. I don't know why, but they made a fish smile. And then they thought, oh, okay, if the fish can smile, the fish can also be sad at the same time. So we've created two states of the fish, a smiling fish and a sad fish. And also, for some reason, this is the actual um, name of the of that game. Uh, also, they made a fish be either a girl or a boy. And so this made all the difference because people suddenly got so attached to these fish characters because they were real 
fish that were, had emotions. And so this game, the first week, it was a couple thousand players. The second week, hundreds of thousands. The next few weeks after that, millions of people started playing this game. Our servers were crashing every minute. Um, but this introducing this character that has personality, can smile, can be said based on what you do to them, made all the difference. And then naturally we saw if there's a girl and a boy fish swimming in an aquarium, what do they do? They make love. So we made them make love. You could, as a player, you could meet them. And then what happens when creatures make love? They make babies. So we made that. We made the egg drop. And the egg of a fish takes, we made it three days. It takes three days to hatch. And naturally, everybody wanted the baby right now. And so we said, okay, if you want a baby right now, you have to pay. And this game started making millions of dollars a day just because people wanted a baby now and not three days later. So this is just a story of random creativity, random decision making without any data, just because it, it, I don't even take credit for this, it. just because we had creative people having these crazy random ideas. And this is probably the best decision I've ever made in a business. And this is about Epic. When we launched original product, which was a subscription service for books, it is much more now, but originally this was the idea, make books accessible to children under subscription, because when you put them under subscription, you can get all the books without having to pay for them individually. And it was supposed to be a consumer product. I didn't think about it as a B2B or anything else. So when we launched Epic in the early days of it, suddenly a lot of teachers started using it. I didn't know anything about teachers and anything about schools. I only wanted this product to be used by consumers, by families and by parents. But teachers started using it and started sending a lot of support emails. Uh, and there was no traction on the consumer side. And so we thought, what do we do now? We, I don't really want to sell it to teachers. That's really not what the purpose was of, uh, of this product. And we had deals with publishers where we had to pay for each book read. So we had this crazy idea. Let's just give it away for free to teachers. Uh, we had some investors already at that point. Investors said, no, crazy. You're crazy. You're going to pay for every teacher. You don't have enough money. You're going to run out of money in a week. And we said, sure, we're going to run out of money in a week or we're going to run out of money in two months if we don't do this. So I'd rather have lots of people use it and run out of money than nobody use it and run out of money later. We'll do it. We'll figure it out how to actually um, pay for it. So we did it. We made it free to teachers. Within a month, it exploded. Because teachers are not really well known for paying a lot of money. So they aren't the um, audience you want to monetize. But it's spread like crazy. As I mentioned today, it's in about 90% of all US schools. And within a few months, all the teachers in the US were using us. We're paying huge money for it, but then we had to go to the publishers and try to renegotiate our deals and tell them, we're not going to pay you for this. Uh, and we had a leverage. We had all the leverage because we had so much traffic at that point. And so from there, teachers would recommend it to parents or kids would see it in uh, school and come home and tell parents, I want to use Epic. And then from there, we started, started seeing a lot of and a lot of signups and paying consumers on the consumer side, so families and parents and kids. And so this, this became our marketing engine. And it was probably the most counterintuitive, but the best decision that I've ever made in business. If we're still free to teachers today, it's an amazing business that can actually do something good for the world and at the same time be successful and make money. So I have a few more stories to tell. This is a kind of a weird story, also about Epic, very early days of Epic. We had free office space for two years at a VC firm in uh, California, in Silicon Valley. They didn't invest, but for some reason they liked what we we're doing. So they gave us free office space. One of the perks of that office space, and that was 
together with the physicists, the physicists were working there and we had a couple rooms there, is that every Monday they would um, bring a fruit basket that everybody can have that fruit. And so the fruit basket would have bananas, apples, oranges, and kiwis. This is not the actual fruit basket. And so what I noticed, and I started observing people getting the fruit, that first the bananas go, the bananas disappear within a day, then the apples, then the oranges, and the kiwis were the last to go. Not because one fruit tastes better than the other, but because bananas are the easiest to eat. Just take them, peel and eat. The apples are the second easiest to eat. The oranges are a little bit involved, but kiwis are just a nightmare to eat. And so that made me realize that if we want more kids to read our books, we have to make the books as easy as possible to access. So we did things like streaming books where you tap on a book and you don't have to wait for it to download. We had the books not open all the way on the screen, but halfway. They would take up half the screen so that it feels like it's a non-committal experience. You can get out of it because it doesn't take up your whole experience. And to me, this was such an amazing revelation that I presented this at another conference with a bunch of investors in the room. It was an investor conference. And I was talking about fruits in a basket and people eating fruits. And the, the crowd was very confused. Those were just investors who were expecting me to show some charts and, you know, the usual gross charts, total addressable markets, all this stuff. And instead, I was working, talking about the fruits. So they were very confused. They thought I'm a weirdo uh, and nobody invested. Which brings me to the next story about investors. So this is obviously misspelled here. It's supposed to say investors. So sorry for the typo. Um, so they're VCs, vulture capitalists, how I call them. I've had a lot of interesting stories with them. When I first started Epic, nobody would invest because 10 years ago in Silicon Valley, the hot things were self-driving cars, machine learning, AI, all these things. And so when I told the investors children's books, they were like, really? Children's books? So I heard things like, this is never going to work. This is never going to make money. This cannot be a business. I heard all these things. I even heard things like, you should not be wasting your talent on this. Go build a self-driving car. Then I'll invest. So at some point when we started to gain traction, all these investors came back. And suddenly they all wanted to invest. And at the same time, ad tech became a hot category. Ad tech actually became a thing. Suddenly it wasn't self-driving cars, it was ad tech. And so we had all these investors trying to throw money at us. And so I made this slide. This is myself, my co-founder of these vultures with big bags of money. And this was one of the slides on my company presentation, one of my company presentations. And so when the investors started reaching out, asking to send them a deck. I said, I don't have a deck. We're not raising money. All I have is this. And so I presented this to, to one of the investors. They saw this presentation and they were offended by the vultures. And they said, well, we're not, a, we're not vultures. And well, I said, okay, then prove it. There are lots of interest in the company. And so they said, okay, we'll give you the best deal. We'll give you the higher valuation you want. So the other vultures don't get it. Okay, so well, pretty obvious who the vulture is here. They ended up leading our round, $30 million round, and actually turned out to be a very good investor. I have to say all the investors in, in Epic were very helpful, very good investors. But another thing I learned from this experience is that you can actually offend investors, tell them anything you want. They don't care as long as you make them money. You can make fun of them in front of them, behind their backs. You can do anything you want with them. As long as you make them money, that's all they care about. And so all these investors are very happy now, obviously, after the exit. Let's see what's next. So going back to the original question about hard work, which is just unavoidable. You have to work hard. But does it have to be hard? 
if you make it fun, if you make it engaging, if you're passionate about it, it really uh, is up to you. Let's go to the next slide. It's all up to you at the end of the day. It doesn't have to feel hard even though you're working hard. So this is just, uh, you know, I cannot tell you 20 years of stories in 40 minutes, but here's some stories I was happy to share. And that's it for today. Thank you.